Hi everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week's first question comes to me from Coldheart19, who says, I just wanted your thoughts on the recent trend of conservative religious right-wingers that now have said they have openly gay sons. Also, what would you do, how would you take it if your son was gay? I can imagine it would be a lot more supportive than the paths they take. Thanks again. Well, thank you for the question, Coldheart. I, uh, you know, people take kind of a cynical view of, like, uh, Rob Portman coming out in favor of same-sex marriage after his son came out as gay to him, and they say, like, oh, well, what would he have done if, his, if he didn't have a gay son? And that's a fair point, but I think one of the major motivations behind a lot of people changing their minds about uh, same-sex marriage and about gay rights and gay people in general is just getting to know gay people. Uh, recognizing that there are gay people all around them, that they work with them, that their friends are gay, that there are people in their family who are gay, and that, it, and that it's not some alien thing, that, that, that it is a, a part of our nature, and it's a part of our culture, and, and a part of our species, and a part of who we are, and that, you know, there's, there's no significant difference between a straight person and a gay person that would necessitate treating a gay person any differently. And, uh, so I think personal experience has to has to play a role. I mean, it would be nice if we could just philosophically argue people out of their bigotry, but that doesn't always work. Uh, personal experience is still the most powerful motivator and the most powerful agent uh, shaping our attitudes. And you know, if if Rob Portman or if other Republican leaders need to be personally exposed to gay people to understand that they don't deserve to be treated in a, a less than equal way then I say then I say good I mean I'm not I'm not gonna punish Rob Portman because he needed to have a gay son to come out in favor of same-sex marriage or anybody else he's on the right side now and you know the the more people in power in government that are on the right side the better so I, I'm, I'm not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth in that way uh, I mean, yeah, it would be nice if, if Republicans, if anti-gay people didn't have to have gay children or, or know gay people personally to realize, oh, wait, they're just normal people who deserve rights. I mean, that is kind of shitty, but that's just the way people are. Uh, and like I say, I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. Uh, if, if you come around, for, for whatever reason you come around, it's just good that you come around. And yeah, if I had a gay son, I wouldn't be an issue at all. Uh, I, I joke with my wife, I mean, we don't plan to have kids, but I joke with my wife that if we did have kids and it turned out that we had a, a, a child who, who turned out to be gay, that it would be awesome because she has uh, uh, homophobic elements in her family. And it, I, it would be nice just to, to proudly show up at family gatherings with our gay son. That would be great uh, in a purely selfish kind of horrible way. Here's one from Jay Pipuli. Hey Steve, I just recently finished Bioshock Infinite and have had my mind blown. Now this is because the story was so, so, so amazing. Have you ever had a story, be it literature or a video game, that just completely blew your mind with some twist? I can't think of uh, a book right now or a video game, but there, there have been movies that have done that. Um, I mean, the one that everybody always thinks of is The Sixth Sense, but The Sixth Sense felt more like a trick than anything. Uh, it didn't really blow my mind. I mean, I thought it was really cool and really clever, and, like, immediately you go back and you see how the movie has been structured to lead up to this, and you think, oh, that's great, that's, that's really clever. Uh, but the one that really got me was Memento. Um, Memento had, and it wasn't like a shock, it wasn't like an, oh my god, moment. But just to see how everything sort of led up to the turn, the trick in Memento, uh, was very satisfying to me. That Of all of like the puzzle movies or the twist movies that have come out recently, uh, that's the one that that really like made me go, oh, my, wow, that's just amazing. I, I, and, and, and not even like that, not, not even like a moment of exclamation, just a very satisfying turn. There's another one as well that doesn't get mentioned very much. Um, 
And spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie uh, Sunset Boulevard, and I usually I hate spoiler alerts, I think spoiler alerts are for pussies, but I don't want people to complain. So if you haven't seen the movie Sunset Boulevard, I'm about to reveal a what I feel is a very significant twist in Sunset Boulevard. Uh, and it's not a plot twist, really, it's a character twist. And there's, there's, there's a character in Sunset Boulevard who is the butler of, uh, the, uh, of Norma Desmond, of the, the faded silent movie star. And the, and the butler is actually played by one of the greatest directors in the history of cinema, Eric von Stroheim. And there's a moment in the movie when it is revealed that this butler, played by Eric von Stroheim, is actually Norma Desmond's first husband. And they divorced, but he wanted so badly to remain close to her, even after they divorced, that he came to work for her as her butler. And when I first saw that, that actually made me go, oh! I mean, that really provoked a, a response of shock and amazement. Uh, and again, and, 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 and really put everything that had happened before with that character up to that point in the film in a completely different context. And just a really brilliant, weird, just strange twist. Uh, and that one really sticks with me. Sensical oxymoron. Steve, what is the best way to debunk the creationist argument that, please read in the funniest voice possible, Stalin and Mao and Hitler were all atheists, therefore being an atheist is bad. I know it's easy to debunk because it's just fucking ridiculous, but I can never seem to articulate a good comeback. Any thoughts? And thanks to my friend Rodney for reading that quote for me. Um, the best way to debunk it is just to point out that Hitler and Stalin and Mao, all those guys, were not committing their horrible atrocities in the name of atheism. Uh, and in fact, in the case of, of Hitler, and uh, and Stalin, I'm not I'm not sure about Mao, but I know with Hitler and uh, Stalin, they personally were not even atheists. Uh, Stalin may have become an atheist at some point, but uh, he was he was educated as a Roman Catholic, and uh, and as Christopher Hitchens pointed out, uh, they 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 essentially set up state religions. They were not atheistic regimes. They were not atheistic leaders. They set themselves up as figureheads of state religions, uh, essentially, if not explicitly. So they, you cannot chalk up the crimes of Hitler or Stalin to, uh, to atheism because they, they were not acting in the name of atheism and they weren't atheists. And also, the argument essentially is a fallacy anyway. You can't you can't point to someone who you identify as an atheist doing something bad and say, see, that's what you get when you're an atheist. You have to demonstrate something in atheism that compels people to do that, or that, that is a tenet of atheism that uh, encourages people to commit those sorts of crimes or to be those sorts of people. And there isn't one, because the only tenet of atheism is that you don't believe in God. That's it. That's atheism. There's no structure, there's no dogma, there's no philosophy. Every, all of those other things are added on top of atheism, and we can argue about those and disagree about those. The only, the single tenet of atheism is that you don't believe that gods exist. That's it. And there's nothing about that that compels you to be immoral or unethical, let alone be a monstrous genocidal dictator. So the argument is completely bogus for all of those reasons. Nunano001, hey Steve, I know this is a long shot, but what is your opinion on the recent passing of film critic Roger Ebert and the man himself? I was actually almost, if not more so, uh, emotionally affected by Ebert dying than as I was Christopher Hitchens dying. Uh, Ebert meant a great deal to me. Ebert's work, his writing, uh, his example meant a, a great deal to me. I actually was I mean, I was a reader of Ebert and someone familiar with Ebert for long before I ever got into Christopher Hitchens. And uh, someone le left a comment on one of my earlier videos, because I, I mentioned Ebert in the most recent uh, episode of uh, Five Stupid Things. And someone said, what's the big deal about Roger Ebert? Why does everybody think that, you know, it's he was so great? Uh, and it's that Ebert... Siskel and Ebert on TV and Ebert himself as a writer and as a personality on television is responsible in, in the eyes of many people, including myself, for 
uh, sparking our love of the movies. Those of us who consider ourselves movie people, whether we're just fans or whether we're trying to make our own movies or we consider ourselves critics or whatever, people who, to whom movies really mean something. Uh, Ebert's important to a lot of us because for me, Ebert was the first person along with Siskel uh, that I ever heard talking articula articulately what a what a perfect word to fuck up. Uh, he was he was the first person I ever heard speaking articulately about movies, um, about movies as an art form, and about movies in terms of critical analysis, and uh, that that had an impact on me. That showed me that that movies weren't just something to go and kill a few hours watching and just laugh and be entertained or whatever. Uh, that they weren't a crude art form, that they were a true art form that you could talk about and you could take lessons from and you could understand and and just uh, he was incredibly important for that and film criticism in general is important for that. It, you don't have to agree with everything that a film critic says, that's not the point. Uh, film critics are offering you their opinion and they're articulating their opinion to you so that you can either agree or disagree. And hopefully, if you disagree, you can articulate your own opinion as to why you disagree. That's the real function of, of film criticism, of, of criticism of anything, literary criticism, whatever. And um, a lot of people miss that point. They think it's just, you know, well, Ebert thought he knew so much, he knew which movies were good. It's not, that's, that's not what it was about. Um, of course it was subjective. He was offering his opinion based on his experience, based on his taste, based on his understanding. Uh, and But learning that lesson was very important to me. And just, he was, you could tell he just, he loved the movies, he loved his job, he loved writing about film and talking about film. And he was just an incredibly influential, important person to me. Uh, and he also wrote what a lot of us consider to be the best blog on the internet the last few years. Uh, when his cancer uh, caused him to lose his jaw and he no longer had his vocal voice, it seemed like his writing voice really came into its own. Not, he had been a great writer before that, but now he was writing constantly. He was writing about everything, not just movies, but about his life and about politics and about religion. And he was, he was just a great writer and a great commentator and, by all accounts, a really, really great guy. Uh, and... I'm, I'm going to miss him. I, I'm going to miss not being able to read his stuff. Doctor Who fan 1989, what got you into making videos in the first place? Sorry if it's an overused question, I'm new to your channel. I don't think it's, I, I've probably mentioned it before, I don't know if I call it an overused question, but the actual, the, the thing that specifically got me into making videos was uh, a, a video called Five Questions for Atheists by Veritas48. Uh, that was the first video I ever made. I made a response video to that, uh, my answers to the five questions. And I did it, and I really liked it. I just liked doing the video, and I thought the video turned out okay. I thought I sounded not like an idiot, <laughs> you know. So I made more. I got a camera, and then I got a better camera, and, you know, it went from there. But but that that first video, the thing that made me say, oh, I'm going to make a YouTube video, you know, for the first time ever. Uh, that was a response to Veritas 48's five stupid, five stupid things. Uh, Veritas 48's five questions uh, for atheists. That was the immediate catalyst. USMC 0311 Corporal Jackson. What do you think about the sec of deaf opening combat arms positions within the military to women? Do you think it is a good idea considering the physical challenges that they will undoubtedly face? Also, what do you think of the don't ask, don't tell repeal? Um, I think opening combat positions to women is, is a great idea and long overdue. I'm completely in favor of it. Um, I think that women have demonstrated uh, the ability to, to, to meet the physical challenges. You know, and if, I, if, if by chance some women can't meet the physical challenges, then I would say that's grounds for moving them to a different role. But not because they're women, because they couldn't meet the physical challenge. The same way you would you would do to a man. If a, if a man, if a male soldier, marine, what have you, can't hack it as a, a combat soldier, 
I would hope that he would be moved to a different position. They won't just say, well, you clearly can't do this job, but we're going to keep you here because you're a man, and men, men are combat soldiers. Uh, it should work the same no matter what sex you are. And I thought the Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal was great. <laughs> I thought it was awesome. I think it's one of the proudest moments of Barack Obama's presidency to me. John Torrance 67, how do you pronounce your last name? With a strong I or as a crudely fashioned instrument of prison torture? Yeah, a lot of people think it's shivs, but there is an E in there at the end, which makes it shives. Steve Shives is, my, is how it's pronounced. Just, it rhymes with hives. <laughs> That's actually the, uh, the guy who used to be in charge of our post office here in Sharpsburg. Uh, a really funny, great guy. Uh, he, <laughs> he, uh, said to, uh, my wife and I, when we came in after we got married and, uh, we wanted to, uh, officially get like a joint, uh, post office box. And she said, cause her last name is different from my last name. And she didn't change her last name when we got married. We agreed that she wasn't going to change her name. And she explained this to, uh, the, uh, the postman and he, she said, yeah, I didn't want to change my name. And, and with a complete deadpan, perfect delivery, he just sh shakes his head and says, I don't blame you. Sounds like Hives. Who'd want a name like that? And it was just, I don't know. You had to be there, but it was just fucking hilarious. You had to be there. It was funny. Practical Magic 9. Your first question answer prompts me to ask, what do you think of Bill's observation of Superman in Kill Bill 2? I found it to be sly and intriguing that Clark Kent is Superman's estimation of humans. I also thought Frank Miller's Superman in The Dark Knight Returns smacked of that idea. I, yeah, it's, it's not my take on Superman at all, but it is a really fascinating way of looking at Superman, at looking at the character. No, no matter how you view it, you can view it the way Bill sort of is making it sound, like it's Superman's intentional satire of humanity that he's sort of recognizing all of these elements about humanity and how weak and he actually sees us as weak and cowardly and is intentionally reflecting that in his Clark Kent persona which makes Superman look like a real dick um, or you can look at it as like an unconscious thing that Superman doesn't even realize that he's doing it uh, he doesn't he actually if you ask Superman you know, what do you think of humans? He wouldn't say, oh, you're cowardly, wimpy little simpletons. You know, but yet he portrays that when he pretends to be a normal person without even realizing it. I think that's really interesting, too. But yeah, that's not how I see the character. I, I come more from the John Byrne school, where Clark is not so much an oaf as he is just a normal guy. Uh, a normal, unexceptional, but competent guy. That's, that's to me, is, is what Superman is going for when he plays Clark to other people. Which is kind of bullshit in and of itself because, I mean, he's a writer for the DC Comics equivalent of the New York Times. So he is exceptional. Uh, <laughs> but, but he's not a genius. You know, he, there's nothing about, you wouldn't look at Clark Kent and think there was something superhuman about him. Uh, but he doesn't have to overdo it with bumping into shit or knocking shit over. Uh, to to sell that. But yeah, the, the Bill interpretation is, is, is a really clever, really fascinating look at the character, I think. Varmint Coyote, yo Steve, what do you think of the idea that all voting ballots should include an option of voting no confidence in the available candidates, the equivalent of saying no to all of them? Yeah, I actually think that's a great idea. I've, I've sort of mused about that myself in the past. Uh, and especially I, I, in the, the further comments after your question, you sort of brought out uh, the idea that if the no confidence vote won, if the none of the above vote carried the, the election, then all of those candidates would be disqualified. And I guess we would just, in a few months, we would just have another election. Um, I think that would be great. I seriously think that would be a terrific idea. Uh, be, because... Uh, one of the one of my major complaints about how government operates, how our government in the U.S. operates, is how easy it is to become a career politician and how hard it is to get career politicians voted out. There, there's not nearly enough turnover in elected government, I think. Uh, so having something like this where you could give people the option 
of voting for nobody and then having that option actually have a real consequence where if you vote for nobody and nobody wins the election then all of the candidates are disqualified from that election and new people have to be selected to run. Um, I think that would be a really interesting experiment. Xander's Meteor, maybe I've missed the answer if it was asked before, but what do you want to do when you grow up, Steve? It's between astronaut and baseball player. Um, and it's neck and neck, because I really have no skills that would recommend me for either job. So that's it for the questions. Before we get to the shout-out, I want to briefly go over the uh, WrestleMania results, because last week I made my WrestleMania predictions and then the show was this past Sunday, and uh, let's see how I did <laughs> with my, uh, my predictions. Uh, the first match they put on in the pre-show was the uh, Intercontinental title match, uh, Miz versus Wade Barrett. I had called Wade Barrett to win, got that one wrong, Miz won. Uh, then it was the, uh, the Shield beating Sheamus and Randy Orton in the big show. I called that one right. Uh, Mark Henry actually beat Ryback, which I got wrong. I predicted that Ryback was going to win. Team Hell No retained the tag team titles over Dolph Ziggler and Biggie Langston, so that's another one I got wrong. So at this point, I'm one for three. Or actually, one and three, I should say. I'm one for four. I'm one and three. It's confusing, really, isn't it? Uh, Fandango did beat Chris Jericho. I got that one right, so now I'm two and three. Uh, Del Rio did retain the title over Jack Swagger. I got that one right. But Dolph Ziggler did not cash in the Money in the Bank contract, so I got that one wrong. Um, if you're not a wrestling fan, this sounds incredibly stupid and boring, doesn't it? Undertaker beat CM Punk, of course, so I got that one right. Triple H beat Brock Lesnar. I got that one right. John Cena beat The Rock. I got that one right. And the eight-man tag with... Um, uh, Brodus Clay and Tensai and their valets versus Cody Rhodes and uh, Damian Sandow and the Bella Twins. That was cut from the show for time, so that did not happen. So, of the ten predictions I made that actually made it onto the show, I got six right, which means I have a 60% percentage of uh, correctness. What a wonderful term that is. 60% percentage of correctness. English major. Uh, which is way worse than last year. Last year, I, I went back and checked. Last year, I called six out of eight correctly for 75%. Still not necessarily something to, like, totally brag about, but better than this year. So, uh, 60%. I guess I would, I would still pass, right? Oh, well. But anyway, so yeah. And I, I'm comforted somewhat by the fact that uh, two of my predictions came true the next night on Raw. Um, Wade Barrett lost to The Miz at WrestleMania, but then he won the next night on Raw and won back the Intercontinental title. So if that had happened at WrestleMania, I would have been right. And also uh, Dolph Ziggler in a really awesome segment that is probably the best pro wrestling moment that I've seen uh, in many, many months mostly because of how hot the crowd was. Dolph Ziggler did cash in his Money in the Bank contract on Monday night, the night after WrestleMania, and win the World Heavyweight title. And again, if that had happened at WrestleMania, I would have gotten that one right. And it seems like WrestleMania would be a nice time to do something big like that, right? A guy cashes in a contract, wins a major title. Fuck you, people who bought the pay-per-view. We're going to do that the next night on TV. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's that's the WrestleMania results. Uh, we'll do that. We'll do this again next year. We'll see if I can uh, call it any better. Let's do a shout out before we get the hell out of here. The shout out this week goes to Thirteen Heathens. Thirteen Heathens gets the shout out because he's sharp. He's sharp, and I like sharp people. He's he's a smart guy and incredibly articulate. He he has really sharp, smart ideas, and he's very very capable of expressing them in an incredibly articulate, intelligent-sounding way, uh, which I am occasionally capable of doing myself. Not today so much, but in general, I feel. So, and he, uh, he left a response video to one of my An Atheist Reads, uh, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist videos, that uh, got me to notice him and was a really, really interesting video, really great illustration of... Uh, he had a great metaphor for what the universe was like... Um, before the Big Bang, or what was here before the Big Bang. He described it as, think of uh, 
what was inside of a bubble before you blew the bubble. It's the same sort of thought. Uh, you can't even necessarily say that there was nothing there because there was no bubble there in the first place. So it's a really interesting way of looking at it. And he, he's really he's a really sh sharp thinker. And if you don't know who he is and you're not subscribed to him, God damn it, subscribe to 13 Heathens because he deserves it. So that is it for this week. I will be back to do this again next week. But in order for that to happen, you have to ask. If you have a question, if you have something you want to hear me talk about, anything at all, leave a comment on this video, and I will come back next week and answer as many of them as I goddamn well feel like. <sighs> Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> um, I appreciate the uh, attention, because that's really the only reason I do this for. I have look-at-me disease. Um, I appreciate you watching, I appreciate you sharing the videos, I appreciate you subscribing and commenting and asking questions and everything you do, you're just the greatest. Don't ever let anybody tell you any differently, unless you do something really horrible, then you should face up to that, really, for your own good, as much as anybody else's. You should face up to what you've done. That's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.